really, really good to be with you. I have been told that the 11 o'clock is a rowdy crowd, and I am looking forward to that and having a good time. Uh, I gotta be honest with you too, Lamoris Crawford is a good friend of mine, and so I like to kind of mock him sometimes. I'm like, come on, somebody! That's what he does, and I don't know if he did that here. I'm assuming he did. There was a couple laughs there. Uh, but what an amazing guy he is, and what an amazing story he has. He is passionate about Jesus, and honestly, that's what I want to talk about today. I mean, at the end of the day, what we are talking about today is sloth, so just prepare yourself. It's going to be amazing. Sloth. Can we just turn to someone next to you and say that word, sloth? Sloth. Sloth. Yeah. It's kind of a weird word, uh, but we're diving into that, and we're diving into that for a reason, because honestly, I'll set this up a little bit differently for this service. I'm a little concerned that sloth is creeping into our culture, and it is doing some damage to our relationship with Jesus. I don't think we think about it as kind of this silent killer, and yet sloth is one of the seven deadly sins. I mean, anybody want, want to list those off for me real quick? I know this is on the tip of your tongue, right? We got the pride. Who's, who's going to help me now? You're supposed to be boys. Greed. That's good. Lust. Envy. Gluttony. Hey, who's excited about gluttony on Thursday? Yeah. Okay. That's the one day a year gluttony's okay. May it be so. I'm a pastor. You can trust me. Um, <laughs> uh, and I want you to know, I'm here today as living proof. You can trust a pastor who's wearing brown shoes and not white shoes. Just throw that out there. It can be done. It can't, well, it remains to be seen, I guess. It remains to be seen. You have all of these different deadly sins. Greed, pride, lust, envy, wrath, and then you get to the ones that you don't really think about that much, like gluttony, okay, okay, sloth, what even is that? I just instantly think of those movies recently where the sloth is the person at the BMV, you know what I'm talking about? They're like... And it's an entirely accurate picture of the Bureau of Motor Vehicles. Uh, no offense to anyone who works in, in that area of, of labor. Uh, <laughs> but sloth is sneaky, because sloth is all about indifference. It's all about apathy. And that's a killer of the excitement and the passion that we are to have about what Jesus has done for us. We cannot lose sight of all that he has done. And what I love about this church, you guys, it's alive. People are being baptized. They are saying yes to Jesus. Don't take that for granted. Get excited about that. Let's cheer for that, because that's worth getting excited about. And I think that what we forget a lot of times, we forget the hope that we have in Jesus. Can we just be real? We get distracted. We become a little apathetic. We, we become busy. And we lose focus of what God has done for us. We lose that excitement. We lose that passion. And we forget that we're surrounded by people who are desperate for the hope that we have in Jesus. And I want to encourage you today to, to fight through the apathy, fight through the indifference, to be passionate about who God is and what he's done for you, to make sure that you're focused on who God is, who he's calling you to be, that you're taking advantage of every opportunity that he gives you to make an impact for eternity. Because you guys, we have a limited amount of time right here on planet Earth where we get to make a difference. We get to invest in things that have eternal significance. God allows us to go on the journey with him and help change people's lives. How cool is that? That we get to be a part of that. And when you think about it, you know, we have a limited amount of time. And I've started thinking about that. Uh, <laughs> Tom Brady and I, we have a lot in common. Um, we're both 44 years old. And I guess that's it. I guess that's it, really. Uh, I guess the similarities end there. And as I entered into my 40s, it happened to me the same as everybody. You hit 40, it's like, oh, yeah, total midlife crisis. I went, yeah, I'm just kidding. Uh, I started thinking, oh man, you can kind of put in perspective. I'm, I've hit the halfway point, most likely. If you're a, a woman in America, the last I checked, your average life expectancy is around 79 years old. So get excited about that, ladies. Give yourselves a round of applause. 79 years, it's fantastic. Guys, we only get 76 years. And I just say, thanks a lot, ladies. <laughs> and that's how you alienate half of a crowd. Okay. 
Oddly enough, you have even left, less of a life expectancy if you are left-handed. So I'd, I'm left-handed. And I'm going, what? For real? <laughs> Life's already so hard. I, I have to use scissors that are angled the wrong way. Can never find golf clubs. Try to find a baseball glove. Good luck. It's just not fair. Now I don't get to live as long? <laughs> the heck, man? <laughs> so we have this limited amount of time on planet Earth to make a difference. Ah, don't let the devil distract you. How about that? Let's start there. Don't become apathetic and indifferent to what God has done. Because you have a chance to live into a beautiful purpose and plan that God has for your life. I think about uh, the people that have gone before me that made choices to follow Jesus where, where their decisions rippled through eternity and impacted my life. I go back to the 1950s, my grandpa Fisher, MZ Harold Fisher. I'm so thankful that that name wasn't passed on to generations. I would have been MZ Harold III. That would have been terrible. Um, and yet, MZ Harold in the 1950s after serving in World War II, getting a job at DuPont where he was making some serious cash in the 50s. He was making 30 to $40,000 a year in 1951. That's, that's like $37 million a year today. It's fantastic. <laughs> and gas was like 16 cents. It's amazing. That's a rolling in the money. He made almost as much as Kevin's kids. So... <laughs> he came from a family that was really dysfunctional. What they were most proud about was that his grandparents ran with Frank and Jesse James, the James gang. That's the Fisher family. That's who we did. That's, that, that's what we were doing. If I received any inheritance at all, it was probably the result of a bank robbery. That's, that's what I'm living off of right now. And, and God radically changed my grandpa's life. He encountered Jesus. He was invited to church by a friend. He accepted Jesus and he accepted a call to become a full-time pastor. He said, God changed my life. I have to share this good news with everybody I can. He went to Bible college and became a pastor. The only memories I have of my grandpa are a small church pastor in West Virginia. When I was a kid, middle school, high school, we'd go visit him. He lived in a single wide trailer beside a church in West Virginia. And I think we're in Ohio. It's still okay to make fun of people in West Virginia here in Ohio. That's, that's okay. Yeah. Always an adventure to go to West Virginia and visit my grandparents. And my grandpa, he had nothing. He had nothing. And was one of the most joy-filled, happiest people I ever knew because God had changed his life and he was passionate about that. He was gonna use every chance he had to connect somebody to Jesus. That's the life. So he has two boys, Richard and Mike. Mike's my dad. My dad gets a call to ministry. He becomes a pastor. He just retired. He's served in the same church for 37 years, an amazing life work. And so I grew up in that church. I had to go there an hour before the first thing happened every Sunday. I mean, I hated. it. I became so good at wheelchair wheelies. Like that was an investment. Honestly, I feel like when I get to the nursing home someday, I will be the life of the party. I, I, I can do all kinds of tricks in a wheelchair. I'm pretty awesome. And so I learned how to play foosball because we had a foosball table. I'm pretty amazing at foosball too. And because of, of my exposure to church all growing up, boy, the last thing that I wanted to do was be a pastor, to be perfectly honest. I saw all the behind the scenes, the church is filled with people and people are terrible sometimes. And so I saw all of that. Never wanted anything to do with ministry. <laughs> and yet God, boy, he was calling me. And I recognized it a lot later than most. In fact, when I got married to my wife, Dana, about three months before we actually got married, she made it a point to say, hey, Tim, just double checking. You're not gonna be a pastor, are you? And I'm like, oh, 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 oh no, that's ridiculous. And it was nine months after we were married that I was called to ministry. I mean, no kidding, I, I did that to her. And thankfully, man, she, she was all about it. And so I look at the journey that I'm on. I look back at the people who blazed that trail. When, when we make choices to say yes to Jesus, when we encounter that and we embrace that with passion and with excitement, when we take advantage of the opportunities that God brings 
our way to influence people and invite them to a changed life, share the hope that we have with them. Those are moments that ripple through eternity. We have no idea the way that God wants to use us. And I don't want you to forget today the impact that your actions have. Don't become apathetic to what God has done in your life. Don't let sloth creep in and keep you on the sidelines. Because I want to say this again, we are surrounded by people who have no hope. And I think that the, the farther we get from that moment where we say yes to Jesus, we, we don't realize how profoundly different that life is. I mean, can we just stop and consider what that life looks like? Who, who is desperate for hope? They, they have no hope in anything that is eternal. Put yourself in the shoes of someone who does not believe in God and think about what that existence looks like. What does that worldview look like? They had an amazing interview that happened a few years back with a professor from Princeton. It's like, I get it, Princeton, like eh, Ohio State, eh, Princeton here, I get it. I know how you guys are, I, I get it. Um, but Princeton, it's a decent school. It's no Notre Dame, but it's a good school. Come on, I'm, I'm from Indiana. You have to expect that at some point. <laughs> they interviewed this professor from Princeton and he was a, a professor of secular humanism. And so they're asking him all these questions. He wrote a book on atheism and how to be an atheist and you know, things of that matter. And they're asking him like serious questions. Like if you don't believe in God, like what is our purpose? And his answer is, well, there is no purpose. Well, I mean, do we, is there anything after we die? No, 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 no. Well, then what's the point? Well, there really isn't any. And he began to think of what that worldview looks like. Oh, and it's, it's an existence without hope. And when you compare that to the life that has said yes to Jesus and how different that worldview is, you begin to realize that Jesus answers all the questions that people are desperate to have answers to. Where do I come from? What's my origin? Did I, did I just come here today because I'm the, the result of a weird explosion in the cosmos and it's all by chance? Or did I happen to be fearfully and wonderfully made? Did God create me in his image? Is it possible that I am a child of God? That he loves us with an extravagant love? Think about that as a starting point and how that changes everything. That account in Genesis of, of God forming man out of the dust of the ground, breathing into him the breath of life, and the statement that is made, we are going to make man in our image. We are his prized possession. You are dearly and deeply loved, but listen to me, God loves you and there is nothing you can do about that. How amazing is that? You are his prized creation. And so, I love that account in Genesis. God created man, formed him out of the, the dust of the ground, breathed him the breath of life. And in Genesis 1, 2, 3, you see this progression where Adam uh, is charged with naming all of the animals, all right? It's just, it's just there. And they don't go into detail on that, but, you know, I have an opinion on that. It's, it's Adam standing there as all the animals prayed in front of him. It, it, he's a guy, right? Like a dog, cat, bird, Fish. And I feel like he got bored kind of fast. And then he was just like making random noises. I just feel like that's what's happening. Because it gets more crazy, right? Like, hippopotamus. <laughs> like that, that happened, right? And so <laughs> God, God shows him all of his creation. It says in an amazing way, Adam's lonely. Like there's no one that's suitable for him. He needs, he needs somebody. He needs a companion. And so it says that God put Adam into a deep sleep, took a rib out of his body and formed Eve out of Adam. Like someone who is also made in the image of God that could be his partner. And when Adam wakes up, God shows Eve to him. He's like, look at this creation. This is my gift to you. It's like, surprise, you're really gonna like this one. And Adam wakes up, he's like, whoa, man. And that's how woman was named. That's how that happened. So. <laughs> that's fun for me. I just want you to know. Okay, so. <laughs> that's actually not in the Bible, in case you were wondering. That's, that's just, that's my opinion. <laughs> but 
think about that. that. That's where we come from. That's our origin. Created in the image of God. You are his child. And because you are his child, know this. When you ask, like, what's the meaning of life? Jesus is the answer to that too. You have been created by him and for him. You've been created to do good works that he prepared for you from the beginning of time. You have gifts and abilities that he has prepared specifically for you for this time. You have purpose. Your life matters. You are important to God. And you think about like even our morality, like what's right and what's wrong. Think about all of the direction, all of the commands that God gives us and, and recognize God doesn't give us those commands like to make us miserable, like, oh, how can I make you miserable today and steal your happiness? No, every command that God gives us is for our benefit. If we apply what he says to our lives, that is your best life. You, you live with nothing in the closet. There's no guilt, there's no shame. You are experiencing life to the fullest. And you think about that, a life with no hope compared with a life that knows I know where I come from. I'm a child of God. I have purpose. My life matters. I am his child. He has a plan for me. I know the life that he's called me to. It's a life that is filled with its meaning and fulfillment, and it points me toward a future. I have an eternal destiny that waits for me. God's preparing a place for us where we can live in a restored relationship with him. That's what we were created for, to be in relationship with him. And we have so much to look forward to. This is just the beginning. And when you compare that with people who have no hope, we cannot respond to all that God has done for us with indifference and apathy. God sent his son to die on the cross for us. He paid a price we could not pay. He has set us free. And what do we do? We, can, meh. We, we can't respond like that. And that's why sloth is so deadly. It takes our focus off of what God has done for us. And we forget that we are loved that we are his child, that God has a purpose and a plan for us, that we have a future. We get distracted by all the things that life throws our way. And I wanna challenge you today, as we're diving into this, man, don't allow yourself to become numb to the things of God. Because I tell you what, the devil is good at distracting you, right? I, John 10, 10 is one of my favorite verses because it's so relevant to so many situations. Jesus said, the thief, the devil, comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. And Jesus says, no, <laughs> I'm not cool with that. I've come that you might have life and have it to the fullest. And I'm convinced that when it says the thief is coming to steal, kill, and destroy, I think he's trying to steal your joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord comes from knowing who you are, where you're going. He comes to kill your spirit. He wants to discourage you, to lose heart. Because ultimately he wants to destroy your very soul. And when apathy, when indifference, when sloth creeps into our lives, we begin to forget all that God has done. And we never make good choices in those moments. Those always lead toward places we never wanna go. And it seems innocent enough at the beginning, but man, sloth will take you to places where you never thought you would go. And the thing is, you don't see it coming. I'm very intrigued by the Israelites. Uh, in Joshua chapter nine, uh, you see a story that's very interesting. They're, they're coming off a pretty good experience, right? Like over the last couple of generations, God has led them out of Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt. God sent plagues. He parted the Red Sea. And there's this amazing moment where God sets them free. It's miraculous. The presence of God is literally with them. They get three days into the wilderness and they're like, Moses, we're hungry. I, I think God's got this. Like, he's right there. <laughs> what? And for 40 years, they wander because they're not willing to trust that, that God's going to provide, that he's faithful. 
And so finally they cross into the promised land. They cross the Jordan River. They go to Jericho. They march around it seven times. One of the greatest war plans and strategies in the history of all mankind. How do you want us to fight today? I want you to march around. I want you to blow those trumpets. You got them? Got your trumpets? That's how they did it. God knocked down the walls. They didn't have to do anything except take the land. God went before them, did all of these things. And the Israelites were notorious for seeing God do these incredible things, encountering him in an amazing way, and then really quickly forgetting everything that he had just done. Apathy, indifference, sloth. And so what you realize is in Joshua 9, there's all of these kings and kingdoms that now surround this new Israelite nation, and they're all terrified. They all recognize what their God has done. They're seeing it. And they're all trying to make peace with the Israelites. And God specifically says to them, don't make peace with them because their gods will distract you. Their gods will become your gods. You'll lose your focus on who I am and what I've done for you. Very specific, and that's the purpose. And so Joshua, he's a good leader. He says, we will not make peace with these people. We will stay true to you. So in Joshua 9 is when the Gibeonites appear. Like, ah, the Gibeonites. You know the Gibeonites? <laughs> Nobody knows. Uh, the Gibeonites. What happened with the Gibeonites? Well, in Joshua chapter 9, you see the Gibeonite deception. It's like, ooh, things are about to get interesting. There's a deception. The Gibeonites lived very close by, like three days away. The Israelites were not aware of who they were, though. So the Gibeonites, they put together this plan. They say, how about we send some people to their leaders and we... we get ourselves filthy, dirty, wear worn out shoes and bring like a bunch of moldy bread. And we'll say, hey guys, we just wanna know we're for you and we'd love to make a treaty with you. And we live a long ways away because when we left, this bread was fresh and now it's moldy. <laughs> just gotta see what happens. <laughs> this is real life. I'm not making this one up. The other one I made up, this one I didn't make up. Joshua 9, 14 through 16, it says, so the Israelites examine their food, right? Like, oh, the bread is moldy. No. But they did not consult the Lord. They had already forgotten what he had done. They were already indifferent. Ah, we're, we're good. We did this, we're fine. They didn't consult the Lord. They lost their focus. Then Joshua made a peace treaty with them and guaranteed their safety, and the leaders of the community ratified their agreement with a binding oath. Three days after making the treaty, they learned these people actually live nearby. It's the Gibeonites! Oh! <laughs> they made peace with something they had no business making peace with. And that's what we do. That's how sloth sneaks into our lives. We make peace with things we have no business making peace with. And it's not always bad things. That's what's sneaky about it, right? I've come to realize that if the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. He'll distract you. He'll take your focus off what's really important. And that's what sloth does. It distracts me from my focus. And before I know it, well, COVID's been around for, you know, 19 months. I've binge watched just about every single thing that I wanted to. <laughs> Have I read my Bible very much? Has my prayer life gotten stronger? Have I shared what Jesus has done in my life with anyone? Suddenly, we're spending a lot of our time, not necessarily on anything that's bad, but we're not really investing our time in anything that really matters. And we get caught up in our schedules and we're going to all the sporting events and cheering for the Ohio State Buckeyes when they're easily beating their team 49 to zero at halftime. I mean, like, yay. I mean, Notre Dame won 55 to zero, but whatever, who's <laughs> counting? Um, <laughs> but we get all excited about those things 
And they're not bad things. Well, Ohio State maybe. <laughs> but I, I, I'm just kidding. And I've alienated another segment of the crowd. Um, we allow ourselves to get distracted. And here's the thing about sloth. I, think about this. Sloth is content to aim us toward either apathy, indifference, or fanaticism. That was new to me. When I broke this down and, and learned that fact, I went, what? Sloth is content to aim us toward either apathy or fanaticism. It does not matter. All that matters is that the target is worthless. That's the trap. It's a trap! <laughs> Star Wars meme, sorry. Okay. Sloth is content to aim us toward either apathy or fanaticism. All that matters is that the target is worthless. And so at the end of the day, what you realize is sloth, it's directing me toward failure. Because it's directing me away from everything that really matters. It's directing me away from this purpose and plan that God created me for. And I, I go back to this reality. I have a limited amount of time on this planet. And I'm even more handicapped than others because I'm left-handed and I'm a man. So I, Joel. <laughs> and you realize you got to take advantage of every moment. You can't forget what God has done for you. And you are his child. You are made in his image. He has a purpose and a plan for you. You are dearly and deeply loved by God. You have hope. You have a future. And you have an opportunity right now to invest in relationships, to invest in ministries, to invest in people in a way that can ripple through eternity and change people for generations to come. We have no idea how God uses what we're doing. We won't know until we stand before him in heaven what our actions, what our investments in eternity have actually done. Think about that. God wants to do so much in you and through you. We've just got to stay focused. We've got to stay passionate about who he is and what he has done in our lives. And what we have to fight is the indifference. We have to fight staying in our comfort zones. We've got to allow ourselves to get a little bit uncomfortable, to push ourselves, because that's where the payoff is. That's where we're living life to the fullest and investing in eternity. I want to challenge you. This is one of those statements that you read and you go, what? This is so simple and so amazing all at the same time. It's one of those genius statements where somebody made a profound statement and then they turned it around backwards and it became doubly profound. I mean, those are the kind of moments like if I ever had a moment like that, I also would write a book. I'm just going to throw that out there. Yeah, I would. Kevin wrote a great book, by the way. I mean, you guys know that, right? Yeah, okay, okay. Think about this. When it comes to getting out of our comfort zones and fighting that indifference, recognize this truth. There is no comfort in the growth zone, all right? But there's also no growth in the comfort zone. That's why we can't fall into the trap of indifference. Think about that. There's no comfort in the growth zone. Yeah, I'm gonna have to step out of my comfort zone. I'm gonna have to get uncomfortable, but it's worth it. Because if I stay where I am at in a place of indifference, not really caring what God has done for me, man, there's no growth there. You gotta step out of that comfort zone. You gotta be passionate about a God who's passionate for you. Man, don't miss a single opportunity that he has for you to make an investment in eternity. Because at the end of the day, I believe sloth denies us of our future. We miss out on so much that God had for us. I just wanna challenge you today, don't miss a thing. Go all in. There is so much that God wants to do in you and through you. And it only happens if we step out of our comfort zones and go all in. I uh, remember going to see my other grandpa, not Grandpa Fisher, not MZ Harold, Grandpa Schaefer. His name was Kenneth. It's much more normal. <laughs> and I would say, Kenneth! No, I, I wouldn't say that. I'd say grandpa. And he would say, Timmy, what's going on? He's the only person who ever called me Timmy. So don't, <laughs> don't do it. My grandpa Schaefer 
lived in a little town in Illinois, Oriana, Illinois, population 423 people, give or take three. Um, he was an odd person. I'm just gonna throw that out there. He was kind of a weirdo. He was OCD before anyone really knew what OCD was. When you went to his house, all of the trees in his yard, they were painted white till about six feet off the ground. All the trees painted white. Ever, anybody ever seen that? I said, Grandpa, why are your trees painted white? He'd say, it's to keep the ants off of them. And then I'd see the ants clearly, because it's white. You'd see the black ants pretty clearly. Going, uh, I, okay, never mind, Grandpa. <laughs> He's also the only person I've ever met who had a homemade garage door. Yeah, that's, why, that's right, a homemade garage door. And it didn't open upwards, it opened outwards. So they'd pull their car in the driveway, he'd get out, he'd say, Virginia, that's my grandma, Virginia, you pulled a car in. And he'd get out, he'd unlatch the garage door, and he'd go. <laughs> and then he'd walk through the little door he made in the middle for a person. <laughs> he was weird. And in my grandpa's garage, beside the door that went into their kitchen was a little sign that I saw every time I went to my grandparents. And it was a sign that he had there for a reason. Because my grandpa, as weird as he was, man, did he love Jesus. And boy, did he invest in things that had eternal significance. And he had a reminder that he would see every time he walked into his house, that sticks with me to this day. The sign just simply read, our time on earth will soon be passed only what's done for Christ will last. And that is profound. At the end of the day, that really is all that matters. If you have encountered the love of Jesus in your life, if you've encountered hope, man, never lose your passion. Never lose your excitement for what God has done in you. Never lose sight of what he wants to do through you. Go all in. Don't allow indifference, sloth, apathy to creep into your life. Stay laser focused on who God is, the love that he has for you and who he's calling you to be. What would it look like if all of us were investing in eternity, laser focused on sharing the hope that we have in Jesus? I'm excited about what's happening in this church. Man, I walk into a place like this, it's alive. You're baptizing people. They're saying yes to Jesus. Do not lose the excitement that comes from that. Don't miss out on a single thing that God has in store for you. Stay focused. Let's go all in. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us today at our Be Hope Church YouTube channel. Hit the subscribe button below so you never miss a video. And you can join us every Sunday online at behope.online. Or you can like our Facebook page or participate in our online community through our Facebook group. Thank you so much for joining us today. Please subscribe, share, and review this. Make sure you invite a friend into what's going on. And if you want to support the ministry here at Be Hope, you can learn how to become a First Church champion by going to behope.church slash giving. Thank you so much for being a part of what we do, and we'll see you back here real soon.